All I can need to say is Professor Layla Sadat, she's back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, folks. I love Chautauqua. Okay. Um, anyway, what I'm going to talk about, being a, a woman in international criminal law, I guess that's how I fit uh, into the, the, um, uh, the program here. I, I'm also, I was also struck this morning listening to the young woman um, who got the award from Impunity Watch, who must have been, I don't know, 17, 18, pretty young. Um, and I am even younger, 16? 16. 14, wow. Um, anyway, I am the director of the Whitney R. Harris World Law Institute. And as many of you know, Whitney Harris, whose picture you've seen uh, many times already during this program, is one of the other last living Nuremberg prosecutors. And I'm often telling people that we have four generations of folks in international criminal law. Whitney's 97. And I won't say how old I am, but some of my students are here. And uh, in between Whitney and I is probably Sharif Basuni and people of that generation. Um, but I think today we had the fifth generation of international criminal law folks here. And uh, I think it's a wonderful place here in Chautauqua to recognize that. And I know that I feel particularly honored to head up the institute that bears Whitney Harris's name. And because our institute is uh, at Washington University, which is a very wealthy university that has had a very long commitment to social justice, um, one of the things that we decided to do, and this is from the charter of the Harris World Law Institute, one of the things that uh, we decided to do, in addition to all these other projects that are some of the things that we do as part of being sort of the flagship International Comparative Law Institute, for the Washington University School of Law is to specifically carry out the Nuremberg legacy by starting uh, a Crimes Against Humanity initiative. And the title of this, Crimes Against Humanity, The Need for a Specialized Convention, actually comes from a 1994 article that was written by my friend and mentor, Sharif Basuni. And in 1994, uh, those of you who are specialists will, of course, know this, but for the non-specialists, the idea of reviving the Nuremberg legacy was sort of just getting off the ground. We didn't have an ICC yet. The ILC draft came out in 1994, and the Yugoslavia and the Rwanda tribunals were just sort of getting started. And this law review article appeared that I stuck in one of my file folders in my office entitled Crimes Against Humanity, The Need for a Specialized Convention. And the argument that Sharif Basuni, who's one of really the fathers of international criminal law and was head of the drafting committee uh, at Rome and won the Hague Prize for International um, Law because of that and other things, is why did we never get a Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. We got a Genocide Convention, we got the four Geneva Conventions, but we never got a Crimes Against Humanity Convention. And at the time in this article, which I sort of filed in the back of my mind um, when I read it, he was talking about how scandalous it was, how much apathy there was, how there was a complete semantic indifference to the level of atrocities that was being committed. And um, the Crimes Against Humanity provision that we now talk about comes from the Nuremberg Charter. And when um, Bill Kaming and Whitney Harris and Henry King and Ben Ferenz, when they were working at Nuremberg, they had this treaty that John Barrett talked about this morning, the London Accord, and there were three crimes in the treaty. There was aggressive war, crimes against peace, there were war crimes, and there was crimes against humanity. And um, I hadn't realized that a female lawyer found the legal error in the Crimes Against Humanity provision, which I've actually deleted in this, in this reading of it. But you can see the idea is Crimes Against Humanity was murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, etc. Um, and what I don't have in this particular reading of Crimes Against Humanity is the idea behind it was that you could get 
the Germans in this case, for attacking their own people because it was a crime even if it was lawful in the state where it was committed. It became an international crime nonetheless. So crimes against humanity were pretty revolutionary. And after the uh, war and after the United Nations is created and the Nuremberg Principles are adopted, which we heard about last night, they were adopted in 1946, we got the Genocide Convention. And this goes, I think the young lady who asked the question is gone, but the Genocide Convention, it was adopted in 1948, it criminalizes the destruction in whole or in part of a group on particular grounds, and the grounds are extremely limited. Notice that social and political groups are not included, so that Stalin's uh, massacres are not included as genocide because they were political in nature. They weren't ethnic, racial, national, or religious. The first ever convention, uh, conviction for genocide is in fact the Akiezu case that Alphonse Van referred to this morning, and that shows you of what at least limited utility international criminal law was during the Cold War period and prior to the 1990s. Um, it aims to prevent and punish genocide, that's what the convention says, through both criminal responsibility, that means individuals who commit it can be punished, and we now believe through state responsibility, that is a state could be sued by another state uh, based on the Genocide Convention for having perpetrated, in a sense, genocide. In U.S. legal parlance, we would call that civil liability rather than criminal liability. And the other thing that the Genocide Convention requires, which Fatou Ben Souda mentioned this morning, is this specific intent, this dolus specialis, the idea that the individual has to have perpetrated the crime with the intent to destroy the group, which makes a prosecutor's life pretty miserable uh, because it's very hard to prove. And in fact, um, I would argue that the Genocide Convention, while a wonderful monument to the Holocaust, which is what it really codifies, has very limited practical utility in international criminal law. In Rwanda, the court held ICTR that there was genocide. In the Yugoslavia tribunal, it has been just miserable trying to argue that ethnic cleansing is a form of genocide, even though there have been some case law and articles and the General Assembly said so, and ultimately the ICTY said, no, it's not. It's ethnic cleansing. Pushing people out of a territory, even if you kill 200,000 along the way, isn't the same as trying to exterminate them because of their ethnicity or some other characteristic. So you'll see in a moment how I get to the 90 million uh, casualties, and, and I'm realizing as I'm hearing now that my slides are highly under-inclusive, but in any event, the Genocide Convention as a legal instrument then has had very little practical utility um, as an instrument. Now, I have a confession to make about this slide. Um, it's actually a slide you can see I've credited Professor Woods, who's down there. But the original title of his slide wasn't Estimated Crimes Against Humanity. It was Estimated Genocide. And we changed it at the Harrisons. We're doing our own database and our own matrix right now. But almost all of the examples of deaths in this slide are not genocide as a legal matter. And so we changed the slide to say estimated crimes against humanity because they all would have been crimes against humanity. And, in some, and, and one of the things that my wonderful students are going to be doing for us is putting together a complete matrix um, of, of, of crimes against humanity cases and not just including deaths because one of the things that Fatou Bensouda said this morning is in some of the cases the other atrocities are even greater than the murders, and of course, crimes against humanity encompasses that. But if you look at this slide, which I count to be about 70 
million deaths um, between 1900 and 2005. You'll see it's under-inclusive. It really doesn't have Congo numbers in it. It really doesn't have a lot of the conflicts that we now talk about. And so we've been trying to sort of collate this. But nonetheless, if you realize, and I wish I was good at PowerPoint and I could take all the red dots away now, except Rwanda and Nazi Germany, which are the only two which are agreed upon legal genocides, you would see that virtually all the deaths that we can easily consider crimes against humanity are in fact not covered by the Genocide Convention. Um, and these are some slides that are a little bit more inclusive. We started to put together some numbers, but you can see that, and this is the death toll, right? If we start to add the rapes, the other examples of sexual violence, the inhumane acts, the persecution, you can see that the figures would be a lot more. Um, and I'll just, I'm not gonna go through these, but you can see in these, um, slides, we've got some of the conflicts that are missing from Professor Wood's otherwise very nice slide. Um, so what happens with crimes against humanity? It kind of floats out in the air. A few national legal systems had crimes against humanity statutes. France was one, and in fact that's how I got into this research was with French cases. Um, when the international tribunals start, they all get definitions of crimes against humanity, but all we had to work with was the Nuremberg Charter, Article 6C, and so they're all different in all the ad hoc tribunals. One of the great advances was the Rome Diplomatic Conference in uh, 1998, and crimes against humanity in that conference, which included 165 states and probably 250 NGOs or more, came up with, as you can see, a much longer definition of crimes against humanity. And it's not my purpose today to go through the definitions. That is, is a, a laborious process. But just to show you, even visually, the difference between Nuremberg, Article 6C, very short, very focused definition, and the much longer definition that was elaborated at Rome, in part because states were creating a court with prospective application, and so they wanted to limit the definition accordingly, as well as codify it. And these are some other definitional provisions in the Rome statute. Um, it goes on and on. It's actually two pages long, so it's, it's a quite, more, quite a bit more extensive. So how do we start our... Um, Crimes Against Humanity initiative, and, and what are we trying to do? One is obviously doing research on crimes against humanity, its manifestations, its, um, its phenomenologies, the etiology of the crime, and the way the crime surfaces and what it, what it is. But the other thing that, that we're actually doing is drafting a treaty um, as part of the initiative. And we've had, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it. Why now? Uh, one reason is the ad hoc tribunals are going to be shut down. Um, the ICC is fabulous but small and has no mechanisms for interstate cooperation and uses complementarity, meaning that national courts are supposed to be the courts of first resort, the ICC the court of last resort. Um, there is some interest in the United States. The U.S. is not a supporter of the International Criminal Court, as many of you know. On the other hand, uh, that doesn't mean that the United States doesn't support other international justice initiatives. And in fact, the U.S. has been a big supporter of the ad hoc tribunals and um, this um, initiative. We have received a, a lot of support from our government. And of course, the, de the development of the jurisprudence on crimes against humanity has been extensive, as you've already heard. So what is the initiative? Um, the first part of the project was preparing it. We have a steering committee of distinguished uh, leaders in international criminal law that have directed the project and, and developed a methodology. We've held a lot of expert meetings in a private discussion phase where we sort of floated the idea of the convention. What do you guys think? Do we need this convention? What would it add? And we got some wonderful feedback, both in a meeting in April in St. Louis and in The Hague. Um, the third phase, which we're starting to move over, out to, is widening the consultation now, talking to practitioners, talking to government ministers, talking to non-governmental organizations, really getting a more consultative, uh, cooperative 
uh, process where we can get more feedback on the draft convention. And finally, we're talking about launching a global awareness campaign on crimes against humanity with regional meetings in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America, as well as Europe. So, well, you know who I am. Um, but our steering committee includes Sharif Basuni and uh, Justice Richard Goldstone, Bill Shabis, who would be mad at me when I say things like, I don't think genocide is actually the crime of crimes, um, because it probably doesn't matter to the victim why they were killed. Uh, and, and anyway, but Bill is a, a wonderful supporter of this initiative, as well as Hans Corral, and then Judge Christine van den Wingert, who's now a judge on the International Criminal Court, and Juan Mendez, and they have been wonderful. We have almost all the regions in our steering committee and our wider group, although we don't have extensive participation from Asia. And this is just, um, I wanted to show some of these photos from the first and the second expert meeting. Um, you can see at the top right, you can see several ju two judges of the International Criminal Court, um, Ted Marone from the ICTY. We had very extensive uh, collaboration. The other photos are from the April experts meeting where we commissioned papers on different aspects of crimes against humanity. Um, the bottom photo is Whitney Harris who addressed us. And one of the things that, it, I don't want to cry, but last night it was so emotional seeing Henry King and, and realizing that Whitney is probably not going to be um, coming here again. He's not very well, and Whitney, um, this is really part of his legacy. And the, the really cool thing about this photo, though, is on the upper left um, is Ridgely Hall at Washington University School of Law and other the, at Washington University. And other than the fact that it's a really pretty building with nice plants, it is also the site of where the 1904 Interparliamentary Union met and called for the Second Hague Peace Conference to be held. And that took place in St. Louis in 1904 and the result was the 1907 Hague Peace Convention. So we paused uh, for a historic remembrance there. So this is the timeline. We've had a lot of experts come to our meetings. We've been reformulating the treaty uh, through uh, phases one and two. Um, you can see our own David Crane there, and our former ambassador for war crimes, Clint Williamson, also some judges at the Hague meeting. And the photo on the left there is the standing ovation that Whitney Harris got when he spoke at our April conference, which was one of his last uh, major um, speaking events. So phases three and four, you, those of you who've worked with Sharif Basuni will recognize him there. He obviously is heading up the drafting effort here. Um, and as I said, the things that we're looking to now are meeting with legal advisors, meeting with um, NGO representatives, having a capstone conference in Washington, probably in conjunction with the Brookings Institution, which is now a partner of Washington University School of Law. And Cambridge is going to be publishing the whole endeavor. So what do you get for the convention? Um, what do you get that you don't have in the ICC? The idea with the convention is that even though we have all talked about things we don't like in Article 7 of the ICC statute, the consensus is that the convention will essentially copy Article 7 of the ICC statute. A, 110 states are parties to the ICC. B, it was widely negotiated and worked over uh, almost ad nauseum at Rome and for the four years prior to Rome, making it impracticable to think of evolving that definition. So how does a state-to-state -state convention help the ICC, in a sense? Um, one is way is that it focuses on prevention. And so in the convention, once we start circulating it, you'll see there's a lot of preventive language and state capacity building language. Um, the other thing is that it fills the enforcement gap, the out dedere, out judicare, for the non-specialist, that's the duty to try or extradite. That's what you don't get in the ICC statute. You don't get state A having an obligation to give to state B uh, an accused, accused of crimes against humanity unless there's some treaty between them, and the ICC statute can't fill that gap. You also can potentially get universal jurisdiction, which is obviously a key element of the convention. You can get mutual legal assistance if you have evidence in state A that state B needs in order to bring a crime against humanity prosecution. You get that. 
Um, it will establish a treaty monitoring body. How big that body will be and how it will be funded is something that's right now being negotiated. Um, but it will have a committee on crimes against humanity the way there is a committee on torture. Probably uh, it won't hear individual complaints. It will just be a state capacity building ratification implementing legislation body at first. If the states want to go further, they can. And the other one, the bottom one, is you get state responsibility, which you can't get with the ICC statute. You can only get with an international um, treaty. I'll, I'll end there. I didn't want to take a lot of your time. What I really wanted to do was talk a little bit about completing this legacy, what the initiative does. I think one of the ways that I'm worried international criminal justice is going to evolve is once the ad hoc tribunals are shut down, um, I heard Stephen Rapp recently say this in The Hague, you have those 56 judges, you have those thousands of staff, you have those cases, those prosecutors, all those individuals, where do they go? Does it just get lost or does it go somewhere else? Can it all go to the ICC in five years? Maybe if the states want to have a huge ICC, but right now it's a pretty small institution. So where it's most likely to go, at least at the beginning, is national jurisdictions. And so it's really important not to lose the gains that we have had since 1992 when you have this incredible period of progress starting to draw to a close. I know the prosecutors would probably love to talk more about this, how the closure of their institutions is going to affect the legal landscape and the political landscape and where they are. And one of the things this initiative is trying to do is sort of come in and provide some interstate mechanisms that come complement the important work of the ICC and can fill that gap. Um, I thought I might end, since not everybody has this beautiful book, thank you, American Society of International Law, for doing this. And it actually has the whole poem that Whitney wrote that we put a little extract in. So would you mind if I just read this in honor of Whitney and to close my, my presentation? So, and, and I can take questions, but maybe we, we want to break. I'll ask the organizers. So this beautiful poem that Whitney gave us last year, he wrote, How does it end, this time of man on earth? Will it be by a flood of the seas over the land, the return of the monster, Tyrannosaurus Rex, the crash of a comet into the earth? None of these. The forces of nature we shall surmount. We have naught to fear save ourselves, only ourselves. The tyrant must be forced to end his tyranny. The aggressor must be punished for his aggressions. And law, not force, must rule the world. Man's destiny, I might add women's destiny too, lies in the hands of man. Thank you very much. Um, Greg, what's our, what's our program now? I'm happy to take a couple questions, or if we want a break. Any questions? People are, are going for the sunshine, I think. One question. Oh, well, that's really a question for the prosecutors. You're, one of the prosecutors want to... Do you tape your interrogations? Anyway, um, any other questions? One more question. I I'm not going to talk about torture. <laughs> yes.
Um, the, it, it has been increasing over time, and yes, there are a lot of ethnographic studies that talk about, you know, if you have failed states, obviously it's worse, but sometimes it's not failed states, it's Stalin, right, which is not an example of a failed state. Just let me add one more thing. You can sign up at our table if you want to be on the Harris Institute list, and I should also, I was remiss in not introducing Don Taylor, who's just joined us from the ICTY as our new executive director and um, is uh, working really hard on this project. Thank you very much. This has been a very special, special day, and we look forward to picking this all up tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Of course, tonight, we welcome one and all to Judge Wald's presentation uh, after dinner tonight at the Athenaeum Hotel, and after that there'll be a very special presentation of the NBC News will be here, and we'll talk about a program entitled The Wanted, of which one of the cast members is David Crane, and other folks will be participating from NBC, and that starts at 8.30. So with that, thank you very much for all of your participation, and thank you all, prosecutors and presenters.